So I've gained an unfortunate but deserved reputation for hating on Baldur's Gate across the life of this channel, the very short life of this channel that is. But as the year came to a close, I asked myself, what is the best game of 2023? And I said to myself, well, it's Dave the Diver, probably the small indie game that I've really enjoyed playing lately. But then my Socratic inner voice said, yeah, but Old Man Banjo, what about $60, $40 AAA games? Was it Modern Warfare? Was it Starfield? And my inner voice responded, um, it's probably Baldur's Gate 3. Yes, the general state of gaming has driven me to the point where I'm doing yet another video on Baldur's Gate 3, because I do have to agree that it is probably one of the better games of this year. But I also want to explain why I think that Baldur's Gate 3 is just an okay game. And the fact that it's probably the best game of this year is actually just a sad sign of the gaming industry. So stick around and I'll try and explain my view on this in a less acerbic way than I have in my previous videos. If you watch my previous videos on this, you know that I can be a little bit on the snarky side and I'm trying to work on that because I don't think it's very good for reviews. It might be good for engagement though, but you never know. It's just a thing you work on as you become a YouTuber. I'm still kind of new at this. But anyways, let's get into the video. So first off, I want to start with what wasn't true about my early access rant that sort of blew up, well, blew up for a small channel about this and that people were right to point out is wrong, even though they are pointing it out from the perspective of people that have bought the full game. Well, in early access, there weren't a lot of ways for non-combat resolution, at least not nearly as many as there are in the full release. Keep in mind, I wasn't just playing the early access, I was playing the early, early access. So. The criticism that I made that the game encourages you to basically murder your way through every situation is no longer valid. There's a lot of options for non-combat resolution. They've also dealt with the thing I accused them of, that their quest design makes no sense. The zones are now more filled in with different NPCs and different ways to solve quests. And also the pattern and link between different quests and different zones is much clearer than it was in the early access, where it would be sort of unclear why I should just go and wander over here. I don't know. They, maybe I'm not articulating myself well, but the game just flows better in general. Your conduct in there was not only unbecoming an officer, it was equally reprehensible as a medical man. Between different quests and their design. The other thing I complained of was a general lack of dialogue options that also didn't end in combat. And they've also fixed that. There's a lot more detail, uh, especially in between party dialogue, than there was in the early, early access version of the game. Overall, I don't think I need to tell anyone this that's played both the early access and the full release. But for those of you that just played the full release, Larian really put in the effort to make this a full game and they didn't rug pull their early access uh, users. And that's to be, uh, I mean, is that the baseline now? I think, I, I feel like on one hand, I want to praise Larian for not scamming their early access buyers. But on the other hand, like many things in this review, I sort of think, wait, is that the baseline now for being good? Well, I don't know. Let's move on. Well, going on for the sake of this video, I want to break down my criticisms of the game into basically three categories. The stuff that is reasonably benign, but annoys me that I don't feel other reviewers have picked up on, partly due to the hype surrounding the game and possibly fears of annoying the fans of this game, which if you do, well, I found out what happens. Then I want to go into the stuff that I think is just genuinely neutral and I don't really attribute to the success of Boulder Skate 3 any more than general things surrounding um, CRPGs and Dungeons and Dragons more generally. And then I want to go into the things about the game that I find downright crap and that annoy me and are why I didn't enjoy the game. In this video, I'm going to avoid spoilers as much as I can. If you're some idiot that comments, oh my god, you didn't discuss the narrative, did you actually play the game? Don't do that, and please don't post spoilers in the comments if you can absolutely avoid it. I'm going to talk about the general arc of the story, but Baldur's Gate 3 is a really, really long game, and I don't, and, and also there's multiple paths, so someone might want to play through the game twice to experience the multiple paths, and I don't really want to go into that and my experience of particular paths in the game if that might ruin somebody else's experience. This really isn't like a narrative analysis of Baldur's Gate 3's storyline. It's just my overall experience as a long-term CRPG fan and huge Baldur's Gate fan of playing the game and 
why I think it's overrated. So, let's start with the benign. One of the most benign things that has occurred since I've been making videos on Baldur's Gate 3 is being gaslighted by fans of the game that I'm not experiencing the huge amount of bugs I'm experiencing in the game, despite multiple people commenting on my YouTube videos saying they're experiencing the same bugs. And despite Larian in multiple patches announcing that these bugs exist and that they fix them, which is a good thing. But the gaslighting is super annoying. I mean, if I acknowledge the bug exists and Larian acknowledge the bugs exist and my fa uh, fans, yeah, that's too cringe, my subscribers acknowledge the bugs exist, we should all be able to acknowledge the bugs exist. We should acknowledge that Baldur's Gate 3, especially in early access, was very buggy. That's to be expected. It's an early access game. And out of early access, it still had some issues. That's just the reality of uh, large AAA productions in this era. They got bugs. The problem is a lot of reviewers just didn't want to acknowledge the texture glitches if your SSD wasn't fast enough, which would let your character glitch through walls. And sometimes even with a good SSD, like the one I bought just to play the game, you can still glitch through walls. Spells can clip in odd ways, and both the normal and tactical camera can get stuck at angles that make the combat, frankly, a, a horrific if not just very unfun experience. And at times, you suffer from awful pathing that's remarkably reminiscent of the actual original games from the 90s, which I don't think was a homage, I just think the pathing is bad. Combined with the fact that there's a lot more interactivity in this game from mines. Oh my god, there's so many exploding mines. If if you want to spoil from this video, watch out for mines and exploding things. That Combine that with the pathing and you can get in a very frustrating situation very quickly. I've also seen people cheese through the game on some of the hardest difficulties by exploiting the game's many bugs. The game is just pretty darn buggy. And it's just frustrating to see its fans crap all over Bethesda games for the odd T-pose, which they should rightly because Bethesda games are notoriously buggy, while reviewers somehow think in a rose-colored glasses way that Baldur's Gate 3 isn't a buggy game. It's probably a lot better now. I haven't actually played it in, I think, about uh, two months now. But it's definitely a game that had a lot of bugs that needed to be fixed. And hats off to Larian for fixing them. But pretending that they didn't exist is gosh darn annoying to me. Because they did. The other benign issue that seems to be absolutely ignored by fans is something that Mark Dara, a designer at Bioware, who I think is currently working on the next iteration of the Dragon Age games, touched on in one of his videos on his channel. If I remember, which I probably won't, I'll link his video down in the channel. But if you type in Mark D-A-R-R-A-H, you'll find his YouTube channel. Larian gave up quite a lot of visual fidelity in order to make such a large game. I cannot for the life of me understand how so many games get complaints these days about the uncanny valley NPCs. While I watched my character in Baldur's Gate 3 stare off into space while clipping through the environment, talking to an NPC that is clearly looking in the wrong direction, who is nodding their head in a way that doesn't seem to match the emotion of the dialogue at all. There's nothing explicitly wrong with this. Big games require sacrifices. Oblivion is one of my favorite games of all time. But we all know that Oblivion can be a bit weird that way. And everyone discusses it to the point where it's become a famous internet meme. But the fact that no one talks about it with Baldur's Gate 3 is just downright odd to me. The last and relatively benign thing is the horrible UI design that the game inherited from Divinity 2. Divinity 2 was a good game in many respects, though I wasn't a huge fan, but the messy inventory system was not one of them. I would rather organize my inventory in Baldur's Gate 1 across multiple characters, or heck, even organize my inventory in Starfield, than fully try to organize my Baldur's Gate 3 or Divinity 2 inventory. It's become clear to me that 90% of the people that responded to my Baldur's Gate 3 looks so much like a reskin Divinity 2 comment are either engaging in very severe cope, or never really played Divinity 2, at least to get familiar with the game's systems. The core engine is the same, besides some shader updates, a new camera that allows for dialogue, and of course the 5th edition rule set. And I think that actually gets us on nicely to our next topic. The things I think shouldn't count towards whether Baldur's Gate 3 is a masterpiece, or isn't. And ironically, the neutral section is probably going to be the most controversial section of this video. So there's one big thing that falls into this neutral category, well, rather two of them, 
and one is the lore and the other is the gaming rule set, and the two of them sort of relate. I know I'm going to get some angry comments from people that both love Baldur's Gate 3 and also love 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, who will fiercely resist some of the things that I'm going to say in this section, but please do try and hear me out before you leave angry comments, and if you actually do respond to what I say, then I'll, I'll try and take what you, you have to say into consideration. But I think what has a lot of people gripped by the Baldur's Gate 3 fever and hype is how awesome the world of Faerun is and how awesome the 5th edition rule set of Dungeons & Dragons is. And to those people who don't play 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, I say, don't give Larian all the credit for it. They bought a nice bit of intellectual property, and they put effort into implementing it and implementing it well. But go online. Grab the 5th edition starter pack and get some friends together for a cup of tea or a few beers and a pizza and play 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons for yourself. I promise you, Dungeons & Dragons, heck, tabletop RPGs in general are magic. And as much as you love Baldur's Gate 3, the experience of playing with your friends with a real DM is a completely different level of quality in terms of the experience. And if you can't do that, there are many online communities now that with engines for playing 5th edition online. And this gets me to another point that severely annoyed me that multiple people made on my last few videos. That Larian are somehow coding magicians or gameplay design sorcerers for being able to implement the 5th edition rule system the way they have. I've been in games with multiple dungeon masters who know how to code, and they've been able to implement a lot of 5th edition rule systems with very, very minimal Python and c -sharp coding. And this is what Larian did. Larian know how to code, they know how to make games, and they bought an excellent rule system, and they executed it. That's it. The long and the short of this is that some people have me genuinely worried that this amazing world of Faerun that's captivated me since I was, I don't know, when did I first buy my RA's first hour at Salvatore novel? I would have been like nine. And it's engaging. Sorry, I lost track there. Thinking about RA Salvatore. Got it. Anyways, the long and the short of it is, is that I'm worried that some fans of this amazing world of Faerun and its engaging combat system will feel that it just exploded onto the scene in 2023 because of the genius of this small indie developer that they've never heard of before. If you watch a lot of YouTube commentary channels, especially the ones that like singling out AAA developers for their failures and monetizing that as an entire industry, you could be left with that impression. That's not to say you can't buy the rights to the 5e rule set and also run a game into difficulty. Solastra was another game recently released based on the 5e rule set, and it met with none of the success of Baldur's Gate 3. And to be fair, in a lot of ways, the game wasn't very good because of choices the developers made. You can't magically buy a rule system and then just make a good game. But on the other hand, having a really good rule system is really going to help in making a game that's good. And in this case, I think it's really important to point out, especially for people that don't have a lot of experience playing 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, the rule set here isn't copied sort of like it was in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, where playing 2nd edition D&D was very different from actually playing Baldur's Gate 2. In fact, I think playing 2nd edition uh, Dungeons & Dragons really wouldn't teach you Baldur's Gate 2 all that well. And the reverse wouldn't happen either. You could play a lot of Baldur's Gate 2, and if you were to actually sit down at a tabletop game of 2nd Edition D&D, that wouldn't help you at all. Trust me, I kind of tried. But that's not the case in Baldur's Gate 3. If you really know how to build and play a Warlock very well in Baldur's Gate 3, and you sit down at a tabletop game with a bunch of friends, you're going to know how to play a Warlock. And that's good. I, I praise Baldur's Gate 3 for its accurate implementation of the 5th Edition rule system. But they didn't build that. Wait, is that an Obama quote? Just if you got a business, that you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. The internet didn't get invented on its own. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Anyways, I feel that gamers tend to only focus on gaming systems when the gaming systems go wrong, like in Bethesda's recent Starfield or that vampire game that those guys made that just Redfall. It was bad, bad gaming systems. Gamers only get mad when the systems go wrong, but they don't see the beauty and the complexity in their design because when gaming systems are working well, people don't notice they're working. But I want people to give credit to the people that actually designed those systems. And as much as they annoy me sometimes, that's Wizards of the Coast. Larian just didn't build that. 
And now we get on to the things that I think are genuinely bad, where I'm going to have to overcome the Canadian tone in my voice where I just generally always want to be too friendly because otherwise this section is going to sound crass. Baldur's Gate 3, in my opinion, in terms of its story, starts in literally the laziest way a game design company could start a story. The game starts off after a ship crash in literally the identical fashion as Divinity 2, on a beach with literally the same textures and in general progress as the previous game. If you are on a sufficient number of mind-altering substances, I am perfectly convinced I could trick you into thinking you were playing Baldur's Gate 3 when you were in fact playing Divinity 2. The openings to the two games are not just similar. This is clearly a homage to Larian's style of gameplay. It is Larian looking old fans like me of the series in the eyes and saying, we own this IP now, this is going to be a Divinity game, and if you don't like it, well, you know where you can go. I don't like this treatment of IPs for various reasons, but to go into that fully is outside the scope of this video because it's almost a different and broader philosophical, economic, and cultural topic. But I'm gonna do a video on that that's in the works now. And like and subscribe if you wanna increase your chances of seeing that. Not that anyone can know what the YouTube algorithm actually does these days. But as the story progresses, a veteran of CRPGs will notice that compared to most CRPGs, even the ones that are sort of story loose, such as Pillars of Eternity, the story just has very few narrative beats or shifts. You will enter an area, you will have a general objective to progress to the next area, of which there are only really three general areas. You will do side quests, lots of them, to level up sufficiently high to complete the necessary combat required for those objectives. In the past, CRPGs have generally been a bit freer form. They're not super open world games, but they also don't require you to play in a linear level up fashion to make progress, at least in such an aggressive way that Baldur's Gate 3 does. But I'll address this a little bit more in the future. In Baldur's Gate 3, you really do need those correct levels, especially on tactical difficulty to progress. In a strange way, Baldur's Gate 3 can sometimes feel like a bit of a single player MMORPG as you progress the story. Much like in a World of Warcraft expansion, every zone contains a bit of narrative progress. This progress can only be achieved by completing side quests to level up. And as you level up, you can further the narrative progress within that zone until you finally get to move on to another zone with a different narrative. While I know some commenter in the video will respond, yes, but that's how 5th edition adventure books in Dungeons & Dragons work now. They're all set up in a Marvel-style arc of you getting progressively stronger doing quests so you can beat up the big baddies. I think that's for a reason, though, that works on tabletop much better than in a game like Baldur's Gate. In the tabletop, they want to set up a general world for you and your party to explore, but a lot of the details of that exploration are going to be fleshed out by the DM. If you've ever played an adventure book with a decent DM, there's a lot of things that they just throw in there to make the world fleshed out. The sort of Marvel big battle, big baddie, and side quest experience boosts are there as a guide. They're not just the flesh and blood of the game. But in the end, that's as much as I'll say about Baldur's Gate 3's exact storyline for now. I don't like the way it progresses, and it feels too much like a Marvel action game. That's, in part, more Baldur's Gate 2 fan fiction with a bit of Marvel in there than it is a new and interesting RPG storyline that I dug into in its own right. It starts with the most powerful interactions in the game between Mind Flayers and Cambians and other entities from the Far Plains, and it really doesn't let up. There's there's no breath in the game, but I'll stop there for now and move on. The fact that the narrative is lacking, in my opinion, also really harms the exploration. A game can have an overall poor narrative, but have amazing exploration. I don't particularly like the storyline of Skyrim, but I really enjoy playing through... What's that world called again? The fact the storyline doesn't have a lot of narrative beats also feeds into why the game isn't, in my opinion, that generally interesting to explore. 
Exploration almost never involves going to radically new or interesting places, but simply finding a way to traverse through the game's different maps. Your character will walk forward along a path that you'll probably have to pay a lot of attention to to avoid being blown up by random obstacles. Your character will then stand there and depending upon the speed of your CPU and your SSD drive, stand there staring blankly as an NPC cutscene will eventually play. You will then be given some dice rolls, some to further your goals, some to avoid or engage in combat. This will either result in getting a quest, progressing a quest, or most likely in more combat. That's what the game is. Walk forward, the game will pause, find out the results. The game only really has three major zones depending on how you count them up, maybe six is overall. Baldur's Gate 2 on the other hand, which is a much smaller game and a much shorter game, has 9 to 14 zones, not counting its expansions. And the range and character of these zones is huge compared to Baldur's Gate 3. You could go from saving a bard in the sewers to a French style medieval keep all within the first hour or so of playing the game. Meanwhile in Baldur's Gate 3, you should expect once you're in Act 1 to be looking at that same map for a decent 20 hours. While some might praise the game for its length, for me this is just boring. It's not the kind of diversity that I generally would want from a CRPG. And for those that think I'm being unnecessarily harsh, this is something that I'm generally bothered with by a lot of modern CRPGs and is not exclusive to Baldur's Gate 3. And I've always preferred JRPGs in this respect for a much wider range of zones and just in general creativity. Now, there's obviously a trade-off to be made, but in my mind, the trade-off doesn't go the right way in Baldur's Gate 3. Baldur's Gate 3 is a mile wide and an inch deep when it comes to exploration compared to its classical predecessors, at least until you reach Act 3 where things maybe open up a bit more. Okay, so this was one point that I'm not sure I wanted to include in this video, but I'm going to include it because of commenters on my channel even though this isn't necessarily my own opinion, and that's about the gamification of Baldur's Gate 3 as a CRPG. A large majority of the people that seem to agree with me that Baldur's Gate 3 isn't, as you've been told, the greatest game to ever grace our Earth, do so for a reason that I haven't actually addressed in my videos, nor was I actually really all that concerned with. Their concern with the fact that it as a CRPG has been so gamified. And it took me some time to figure out what they meant and what it meant for the game. So I'll do my best to explain it in this video. And if you're one of those people and I've gotten this wrong, well, comment below. While difficult encounters, boss fights, and combat mechanics have always been gamified in CRPGs as well as any computer game, veterans of CRPGs might notice that this is a little bit different in Baldur's Gate 3. Certainly, there have been tactical combat games that existed within the CRPG sphere. And certainly, there have been CRPGs that can also be very difficult and challenging. But in general, it's rare to have highly gamified mechanics for quest solving or boss fights. Without spoilers, many boss fights in Baldur's Gate 3 will require you to have a somewhat Nintendo-like knowledge of the mechanics on offer. While people have praised the game for this in certain circles, there are many people who find swapping from their role-playing brain to their strategic gamer brain highly immersion-breaking, especially to do it all at once and maybe not in a way they even wanted to because they just stumbled into combat. And at some point in Baldur's Gate 3, this will be required even on some of the easier difficulties depending on your character level and character powers and how much you've power gamed. CRPGs in general in the past haven't done this. They've relied on character design and ability knowledge rather than gamified segments that one would expect from a Nintendo style Zelda game. And Baldur's Gate 3 at times really doesn't do this. It's much more on the Nintendo gamified side of things. And this is, I believe, why some people that have commented on my channel complaining that Baldur's Gate 3 feels like a Switch or mobile game in the comments. It's the combination of the blindly walking forward and then waiting for a clearly curated gamified segment of content for you to explore rather than exploring the game as a CRPG as a world, a la something like The Witcher 3. At least this is what I think they mean. For me, the gamified segments are reasonably in keeping with modern 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, whatever you think about that topic. Maybe that's a discussion for another video, but I get how some people might find this style of game immersion breaking. But now, let's get on to the final and most controversial bit of Baldur's Gate 3, and that's going to be the characters. Now, let me quickly address the dreaded political issue here that I would rather avoid. 
I do not think that the gendered character creation options here are either left wing or right wing. If you played tabletop RPGs, you know people can get a bit inventive with their character designs. And Larian giving those options is in my mind to be expected within a 5e rule system, especially one made in 2023. In short, I don't think the LGBTQI plus agenda has gone out and ruined Baldur's Gate 3. Moreover, in terms of general politics, the game is pretty tone neutral, if anything to its detriment on a lot of political issues. If you compare it to Deus Ex or Cyberpunk 2077, there's no didactic political messaging here at all. At least, without engaging in some really complex narrative literary analysis about things that happen at the end of the game that I definitely won't do here. So why am I even mentioning this point? Well, as much as I hate to go into the politics, I think I have to address something, and maybe this will stir even more controversy. I hope it doesn't. BG3 isn't politically bad because of its relationship to an alphabeted gender issue. Its politics is bad because it's mediocre politics. It's neither the far-left anti-government rant of an Assassin's Creed game where I can punch the Pope until he submits, nor is it the suddenly right-wing reversal like we see in Far Cry 5, both Ubisoft games. Ubisoft, they really love getting political. But it is still political, even with Larian's mediocre politics. But it's not the politics of Ubisoft's radicalism. It's the politics of latte-drinking, high-income, millennial college students. And I think it's both misleading and insulting to gender issues in politics, regardless of which side of that you end up on, to conflate the two. And I think I have proof for this. But give me time to make an example. My favorite character in Baldur's Gate 2 is Yan Yansen, the turnip-loving gnome. I'm sure many of you who are hardcore Baldur's Gate fans agree with me that Yan Yansen is probably the best character in the game. I mean, you really should. One of the things you'll notice in Baldur's Gate 3 is the lack of gnomes or dwarves as main characters that you can engage with. Most characters are tall, slender, muscular, and generally sexy. I can explain the lack of Yan Yansen in Baldur's Gate 3 very easily. He's not f***able. Yes, Microsoft Word didn't autocorrect f***able in my notes for this video. So we really are in 2023. Well, 2024 now. My point is, if Larian really wanted Baldur's Gate 3 to be a political effort for gender and sexual inclusion, they'd have let us more gnomes. Yes, I'm saying that in a totally serious voice in a YouTube video. The cringe so-called woke aspects of the game don't come from a dedicated political left-wing message. If they did, I'd probably be able to enjoy that more. I play loads of games with political messages I disagree with because, as a former philosopher and college lecturer, I do enjoy differing perspectives and engaging with them. No, this isn't a philosophical or political choice. This is a choice to A, sell sex in a computer game, because if you look at those Steam numbers for those erotic games, those dudes are making a bank. And B, to make characters in the game that are relatable, but relatable at the lowest common denominator. I mean, they're relatable, but in a way that doesn't go that much beyond their sexualized aspects. In fantasy, we're used to characters that can't possibly be human like you or me, regardless of what the race or lore they belong to is. Do you know a Gandalf in real life? Maybe if you grew up in Oxfordshire like me, you might have met one because they do exist there, I guarantee you. Fantasy characters are relatable in general, but they're not relatable in the same way that Steve down at the gas station is relatable. They're larger than life, not just because of the superpowers or the quests they engage in, it's that their personalities don't follow the linear logic of a normal human life. That's part of the beautiful escapism of fantasy. Now, fantasy does bleed into reality sometimes when we have larger-than-life political figures like Napoleon and other people I won't mention. And authors like George R. R. Martin have done a good job of fusing historical fantasy and fictional settings. And in the past, with writers like Herodotus and Ibn Khaldun, we've had the traditional fusing of fantasy and history into works that are both an account and fiction at the same time. And this is part of human storytelling and the wide variety of the ways we as human beings share narratives. But Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't really do things like that at all. I actually know Baldur's Gate 3's characters. Like, I've met each and every one of them in real life, especially the decade over I've spent on college campuses. I know Karlak. 
She's the 20-something engineering master student who's openly bisexual, shows up to class stinking of booze and ecstasy, but generally has a good heart and works hard. Will is the kid from a troubled background going through a lot of things you teach in that group, but if you got him to open up and maybe got him to some counseling, he could reach his full potential as a student. Estarian is that guy that keeps eating a banana seductively in front of you in the teaching room while drawing logic problems on the board. And when you ask for the solution to the problem, he tells you, you really need to go both ways. These aren't stereotypes. I've known these people. And maybe that's because my life is a little bit on the crazy side. And some people might say, hey, that's a tribute to Baldur's Gate 3, that they've managed to write characters that feel real. And I have no doubt that a large majority of the people that have enjoyed the game and its story have enjoyed it because they connected with the characters because the characters feel so real. But for me, they're too relatable in the wrong way. The original Baldur's Gate 2 characters are eviscerated of their personalities. And as somebody that does voice acting, I don't want to get into the drama of Matt Mercer replacing Jim Cummings because that's going to be a voice acting Reddit drama nightmare. Anyways, gone are the over-the-top British supervillains like Arenicus, the spying Russian mage Edwin. Yahira isn't even overbearing or annoying anymore. No one is larger than life. No one character is like Morden Solis from Mass Effect or Garrus for that matter. An impossible persona that exists very well within the narrative to help me feel closer and more interested in the world. Baldur's Gate 3's characters remind me very much of the slice of life characters in an anime. And this actually goes very well along with the voice actors they casted for the game, many of whom dub anime. And do so very, very well. I'm a fan myself of many of these anime and slice of life anime. I just didn't want it in Baldur's Gate 3. Moreover, having characters that are so solely exclusive to the left-wing liberal latte-drinking university campus dweller, don't get me wrong, I've had a lot of lattes and I've also worn a lot of tweed in my time, by hyper-focusing on a certain section, namely the section of Gen Z and millennials in Western liberal countries, they've made the game much less universal, in my opinion, than traditional fantasy. And I don't think that's a bid for wokeness or diversity or universal success. If anything, it's probably played out the opposite way. It's a cynical bid to sell a lot of copies of the game, and that's worked out amazingly. The TLDR of this is, as I've said in another video that I hope is less articulated than this, and this is an improvement, Baldur's Gate 3 isn't a politically woke game. It's just engaged in ill-informed pandering for money, which is something we see way too much of these days. There are games that are genuinely woke, and I'm sure there are games that are genuinely conservative. There, this isn't a political game. It's just a game that desperately wants you to fuck it. And it has succeeded. Baldur's Gate 3 isn't a masterpiece. It's more a sign of the slow decline of gaming that this is the one game that could make people happy in 2023 and 2024. And friends I've spoken to that have played Baldur's Gate 3 as their first ever CRPG or let alone game, well, I'm glad they've gotten involved in it and I hope I'll be able to convince them to play 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons with me soon if they see this video. Baldur's Gate 3 is still probably one of the best games of 2024, but I really hope in the future we get better and I think we deserve better. As those of you who are subscribed to my channel will notice, I've totally left out the issue of how annoyed I am that Larian Games got to buy this IP and basically use it to market Divinity 3 in spirit. And I haven't addressed that in this video because I feel that's a broader issue that actually has nothing to do with game design. I mean, the marketing and economic aspect behind a game doesn't affect whether the game is a good, fun to play game that you should buy. So I've not addressed that here. But in my next video, or one of my next videos, I'm gonna go into the general issue of how IPs are treated in the modern world next so like and subscribe if you want to see content like that and more commentary i hope you've had a lovely christmas new year's holidays and i'm look forward look forward to putting a lot more content on this channel in the future and thanks for sticking around everybody and i'll see you in the next one peace